Welcome to another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot. She called us to live to a higher standard every day and not be satisfied with just throwing a little religion into our lives as a shallow substitute for giving God our best. As this series continues in the coming weeks, we'll hear from family, friends, and others. They were influenced by Elizabeth's life and message. We continue our extended series into Operation Alka and other events during Elizabeth's time in Ecuador. Today we hear about God's timing and about the uh, tendency some of us may have to moping about what's not given. You know, on these programs, you've been hearing the music of John Hansen, whether you realized it or not. Well, today we hear the voice of John, musician who uh, talks about when he first heard about Elizabeth Elliot, also another of Elizabeth's friends, missionary and writer Arlita Winston, will talk about the Alcas, forgiveness, losing some valuable work, and about a turning point. Right now, from 1989, both of our programs today are from February of 1989 originally, here is Elizabeth Elliot talking about God's timing. She says that punctuality was important in her family. We'll hear about prayer and waiting on God. I have a tiny little clock on my desk, and it has a picture of a hand, and it says, My times are in thy hand. That's taken from the Psalms, and I have always been very conscious of time. I grew up in a family where punctuality was a doctrine. My parents were both very punctual. When my mother said that breakfast was going to be at 7.10 in the morning, she did not mean 7.12 or 7.15. In fact, she probably meant 7.9. When my father left for the office, it was with the exact number of minutes in mind that it was going to take him to get from our house on foot to the railroad station to catch the commuter train. We lived by schedules and priorities, And lateness was considered a sin because, my father pointed out to us, when you're late, you are robbing somebody else of his most precious commodity. But because of the fact that I am so conscious of time, I have a tremendous desire to know the will of God now. I don't want to waste time, as it were. And, of course, it's never a waste of time to wait on God. Nothing could be more spiritually nourishing than learning to wait upon God. And I'm sure that because I like to have everything punctual and everything done now and everything laid out in schedules and engagement books ahead of time, God has chosen not to allow me to know ahead of time many of the things that I want to know. He keeps me waiting when I'm praying about something, sometimes to what looks to me like the screaming edge of the precipice. And then again and again and again I've seen it happen. Precisely when I need to know, God shows me. We've been studying spiritual principles in the life of Jim Elliot from his biography, Shadow of the Almighty. He had been praying for several years about the mission field, where he should go, what kind of work he should do. And he began to correspond with two missionaries, one in India and one in Latin America, asking God to guide him through what they wrote back. And he wrote to his friend Pete Fleming, to me, Ecuador is simply an avenue of obedience to the simple word of Christ. There is room for me there, and I am free to go. Jim had been corresponding with Dr. Tidmarsh of Ecuador, and the way Dr. Tidmarsh described the need of jungle work among Quechua Indians, rang a bell with Jim. He felt, this is it. This is God's call. And so, as he says in this letter, it's simply an avenue of obedience to the simple word of Christ. The simple word of Christ being, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So, having committed himself to Ecuador, He was then invited to come to the East Coast to hold meetings in New York and New Jersey and Pennsylvania, acquainting the believers in those areas with the work that he was planning to do and enlisting prayer support. I lived in New Jersey, so this was an opportunity for Jim to visit me again. 
There had been a long period in which we had not seen each other at all, more than a year, and my heart leaped when he told me that he was going to be having some meetings in the East. The trouble was that it seemed to me at that time that God was directing me to go to the South Seas, and I was corresponding with the South Seas mission. When Jim came, we had opportunity to have several conversations, but There was no indication of marriage for either of us yet. And Jim had memorized a poem of Amy Carmichael's, which happened to be one that I too had memorized. And shall I pray thee change thy will, my father, until it be according unto mine? But no, Lord, no, that never shall be. Rather, I pray thee, blend my human will with thine. I pray thee, hush the hurrying, eager longing. I pray thee soothe the pangs of keen desire. See in my quiet places wishes thronging. Forbid them, Lord, purge though it be with fire. And work in me to will and do thy pleasure. Let all within me, peaceful, reconciled, tarry content, my well-beloved's leisure. At last, at last, even as a weaned child. There were certainly times when I wanted to pray that the Lord would change his will. But this was the deepest prayer of my heart, that he would rather blend my human will with his. And as Jim was on his way home to the West Coast from that series of meetings in the East, he wrote this, I thank my God Life has been made so rich, so full for me, sea-like but having no ebb, nature, body, soul, friendship, family, all full for me, and then what many have not, the capacity to enjoy. And he said, lacked ye anything? And they said, nothing. The past is gone, and I am glad, both for its going and for the way it went. God has led in and through and out by the best possible route, we may believe." I am particularly conscious of the Christian's right to expect events to be exactly timed for good. As for God, his way is perfect. Do you expect events to be exactly timed for good? That's what it means to trust God. He is the blessed controller of all things. He's the one who created time. That's a concept I've never been able to really get through my head, but the Bible says time shall be no more in heaven, and presumably space shall be no more. These are concepts which are infinitely beyond my comprehension, and yet I believe that that's true. They are creatures of God, time and space, and my times are in his hands. I do believe that things are going to be exactly timed for good. To bring it up to date, illustration in my own life, my daughter and her husband live in California. They've been paying a very steep rent. They've been trying to find out from their landlord whether he might consider selling them the house that they have been renting for the past year. And he shilly shallies. One day it's yes, the next day it's no, the next day it's I don't know. Then he says, I'll come over Thursday. He doesn't come Thursday. Then he says, well, I'll be there Saturday. We'll discuss the contract. He comes Saturday and he doesn't discuss the contract. And I'm praying, Lord, please meet their need. Please meet it now. And when I get quiet before God, I hear his still small voice reminding me that Valerie and Walt's times are in his hands too. He knows when they need that house. He knows what they need. I get many letters from readers. One of them recently said, How specific is God's will. Have we freedom to choose? Should I pray about what socks to wear? Is the working out of his will dependent upon other people in spite of our obedience to God's will? For example, if others are disobedient? Now there's a tough one, isn't it? Is the working out of God's will in my life dependent upon other people in spite of our obedience? What if my husband is disobedient? What if the landlord is dragging his feet? What if the boss has never really given me a job description? What if the teacher doesn't do what the teacher is supposed to do for my child? 
Do you believe that God's timing is always perfect? Well, I had to think how to answer the letter. One of the things that I told her was, faith is seeing the will of God unfolding in mysterious ways. And the most perfect example I could give her from the Bible to prove that it's not explainable, it is a mystery, was the crucifixion. Remember that Jesus was put into the hands of evil men. In what way, then, may we say that the salvation of the world was dependent upon wickedness? Was it God's will for him to be crucified? We know that the Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. Was what those men did wicked? The scripture says it was. He was put into the hands of wicked men. There's a mystery there. Jesus said, It is necessary that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom they come. We can't harmonize these two things intellectually. We'll never satisfy ourselves on this side of heaven. Trust him. Your times are in his hands. Nothing touches you except through his will. And Jim was praying about the timing of his going to Ecuador. He wrote, Granted, fate and tragedy, aimlessness and just missing by a hair are part of human experience, but they are not all, and they are not even a major part, even in the lives of men who know no designer and no design. For me, I have seen a keener force yet, the force of ultimate good, working through apparent ill. Not that there is rosiness ever. There is genuine ill, struggle, dark-handed, unreasoning fate, mistakes, if-onlys, and all the Hardyisms you can muster. Jim had been reading the bleak novels of Thomas Hardy. But in them, I am beginning to discover a plan greater than any could imagine. God's timing is never late. And that was called God's Timing from 1989 originally. Well, as I mentioned, we'll be hearing from John Hansen. Uh, John is going to tell us about the first time he heard about Elizabeth Elliot. I'm John Hansen, and I had the opportunity, the privilege to write the music that uh, comes before the Elizabeth Elliot podcast or the, the talks. Um, just had a wonderful time with the team at the Elizabeth Elliot Foundation and very thankful for that opportunity. The first, the first time I heard about uh, Elizabeth Elliot uh, was probably when I was a kid. I grew up in the 80s, grew up in a church, and my parents were both very involved in church. And so Elizabeth and Jill, Jim Elliot were very, not just important, but people that my parents looked up to. So I, d- I often heard, whether it be quotes or, or talks, I was kind of like around that kind of both study of the word, but also examples of, of faith and uh, examples of people who answered the call of God and were willing to do whatever God said. Musician, and the one who wrote our theme music, that was John Hansen. As I mentioned later in the broadcast, we'll be hearing from Elizabeth's friend Arlita Winston, missionary and author, and she'll be talking about the Alcas, forgiveness, and more. Now, that'll come up later. But first, we go to a program called Moping About What Is Not Given. Jim was seeing some signs that he should go to Ecuador. How did $315 figure into all of that? Here's Elizabeth Elliot's and moping about what is not given. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says, and underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot. I was telling you the story in our last talk about God's timing and Jim Elliot's seeking the will of God as to his going to Ecuador. One sign after another was given to him, and finally he felt that it was time to go down to the shipping office and see if he could book a passage for Ecuador. There were freighters that went down the west coast and down past Central America to 
Ecuador, which, in case your geography is a little hazy, is on the west coast of South America. He had received several checks from various friends in the mail and some cash that people now and then pressed into his hand after he had spoken in a missionary meeting, and he had simply shoved those bills or checks into his pocket and then unloaded them into a desk drawer. When he went down to the shipping office, he opened the drawer, pulled out what was in there, stuffed it into his pocket, and went down and asked for a passage to Guayaquil, Ecuador. There was a booking, there was an opening on one of those freighters. Just at the time when Jim wanted to leave, February of 1952, and he asked the operative question, how much? $315, said the man. Jim reached into his pocket, pulled out the wad of checks and bills, counted them out for the first time, you guessed it, exactly $315. Jim had said, I think we have a right to expect God's will to be exactly timed for good. When you think about what you've been given, you really won't feel much like moping about what is not given. But sometimes we feel like calling a moratorium on all our other prayers until God answers this particular one. Do you ever feel so desperate about one particular prayer that you just feel as if it preempts all other prayers? I have that experience quite often. My daughter and my dear grandchildren are almost at the very top of my prayer list. My husband, of course, is at the top. And there's hardly ever a time when I'm not conscious of some special need of theirs. I mentioned their housing needs. It's expensive to live in Southern California. My son-in-law is a pastor. They don't have a lot of money to pour down the gopher hole of rent. So they'd like to buy a house, but finding a house for a family of almost six children is not easy. So I've been praying about that one. Now I'm praying about homeschooling. My daughter will be homeschooling her children, and she needs help in the selection of curriculum and in finding the time, making the time, arranging the time to do that with three school children and three younger ones in the house. Sometimes I just feel as if I haven't got time to pray about all the other things, which really are on my list, but I need to concentrate right on that, and Lord, please fix it right now. Give me the answers now so I can get on with something else. One of the examples of a thing which really preoccupies me to the point where I can hardly get anything else done is when I lose something. When I lose things, it drives me bananas, because I am a relatively organized person. I generally have a place for everything, and everything is in its place. And so when I come in to my study and my pen is not in the spot where it's supposed to be, or my glasses are nowhere to be found, I can't think about anything else until I find that pen or those glasses. All work comes to a halt. If I lose a letter, which is particularly important, needs to be in a file and it's not in the file, Then I begin to imagine all sorts of other papers that might have gotten lost along with that letter. Did I file it in the wrong place? In that case, I might not find it for years. Did it get dropped into the wastebasket by mistake? Has it slid down between the filing cabinet and the wall? And I get frantic. And I'd hate to tell you how many times I have turned the house upside down looking for something before I remembered to pray. Now, isn't that ridiculous? So I stop. And I say, Lord, forgive me. You know where that thing is. You know exactly where it is. You know whether I need it right now. Please bring to mind where that thing is. There have been times when that thing has popped into my head instantly. The one place where I haven't looked. The one place that didn't even cross my mind until I asked God about it. And then it was so simple. There have been some other times when it has not popped into my head immediately, and I've chided God because I said, look, you've told me on other occasions exactly where it was. Why can't you do this now? You know what he says? You get on with your work. You do something else. 
Forget that letter for right now. You've got other things to do. Do the next thing. I'll show you when the time comes. When Jim was packing to leave for Ecuador, he wrote this to me in answer to a letter that I had written him about how I hated to miss out on all these exciting things that were going on in his life. Your sense of loss at our not being able to share things these past few months is not new to me. I know it and often tell him about it. And such thoughts as, If thy dear home be fuller, Lord, are consolation. And then the realistic facing of non-accomplishment comes to me and crushes to silence all telling. For if really we have denied ourselves to and from each other for his sake, then should we not expect to see about us the profit of such denial? And this I look vainly for. It comes to this, I am a single man for the kingdom's sake. It's more rapid advance, it's more potent realization in my own life. But where is that advance and that realization? I am willing that my house on earth be emptier, but not unless his house be fuller. And I think it right that we hold God to his own bargain. I err, of course, in making the visible results of our separation the final test. But I reason thus that I should be more importunate in prayer, more dogged in devotion, and should not get, as you say, to a weary acceptance of things as they are. Besides this, there is the somewhat philosophical realization that actually I have lost nothing. We may imagine what it would be like to share a given event and feel loss at having to experience it alone. But let's not forget that loss is imagined, not real. I imagine peaks, enjoyment when I think of doing things together, but let not the hoping for it dull the doing of it alone. What is, is actual. What might be, simply is not. And I must not therefore query God as though he robbed me of things that are not. Further, the things that are belong to us, and they are good, God-given, and enriched. Let not our longing slay the appetite of our living. The title of this talk is Moping about what is not given. Do you spend your life thanking God for what he has given you? Or would you say that you probably spend more time moping about what he has not given you? Practice thanking God. Practice thanking other people. My dear friend Dorothy, old Dorothy Collins, who died down on Cape Cod three or four years ago at the age of 92, She had never married, but she was one of those mature, outgoing, selfless, delightful people. One of her watchwords was, tell them now. Tell them now, Betty dear. Don't wait until they're in a coffin. She was always thanking people, telling people how much she appreciated them. I couldn't tell you what dear Dorothy did for me encouraging me and bolstering me up and cheering me and reminding me to thank God and to thank others. Practice concentrating on all the amazing providences which have made your life as rich and pleasant as it is. Do you have a place to live? Do you have food to eat? Do you have clothes to put on? People who love you? Places to go? The freedom to move around without answering to the police? You know you have all of those things. Maybe it's not the place you want to live, the food you want to eat, those elegant clothes you'd like to put on. Maybe there are some people you wish would love you. You wish you could go places where you haven't been. Stop moping. My friend Vera Laska is Czechoslovakian. She was in concentration camp in Nazi Germany. Not because she was Jewish, she was one of the more than a million non-Jews who were put into concentration camp. She has the tattooed number on her arm. But Vera has said to me, Americans complain about everything. I can't get over the way Americans complain. She said, I wake up in the morning, I look out the window at the sunshine, I say, the sun is shining, I'm alive. In God's time, in God's way, your heart's desire will be fulfilled. 
Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desire of your heart. But the heart's desires need to be corrected. One of the ways that we can contribute toward that correction will be by not moping about what is not given and by thanking God for what is given. Gateway to Joy 110, that was called Moping About What Is Not Given. During the Wheaton Memorial Service in July of 2015, one of Elizabeth's friends, Arlita Winston, took some time to talk about the Alcas, about forgiveness, and about some valuable work that had been lost. It's almost seven minutes in length. Here's Arlita Winston. I think often about your granny returning to the very tribe that murdered your grandpa in the jungles. Your mama, Valerie, was only three, and one night she asked if one of the tribesmen was her daddy. No, your granny said. These are the men who killed him. Oh, said your mama. That was all. In those six words, your granny, so direct and true, began teaching your mama forgiveness. I watched her live forgiveness to the end of her days. Her biggest wonder of all was God, and her most favorite book in all the world was the Bible. She loved words, but in the Bible's words, she found power that could change her life. And she learned the power of forgiveness. Your granny had a brilliant mind. She was a superb debater in college. She was a fine linguist, a writer, a musician, and a lover of knowledge. She was well equipped to be a missionary and to do something big for God. But was that enough? You know how she spent three years getting to know an Indian language that had never been put into writing. You know how that suitcase full of those writings went tumbling over the mountain, never to be retrieved. You know how one day she heard gunshots. She ran out to see an Indian painted in red war paint. Her translator lay dead on the road at her feet and his brains spilling out on the road. And there lying in front of her were the words that she desperately needed. Did you know, though, that she felt a total failure? What was missing? We were doing dishes together in my kitchen one night when she told me, Arlita, I was lying in my hammock in the jungles, turning these events over in my mind, and I cried, God, you've allowed all of this to be destroyed. I've given you my life. Three years are gone over the mountainside. Why am I even here in the jungles? And she had been reading in Isaiah 43 that Walter just read. She came to verse 10. You are my witness, Betty, saith the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand who I am. Arlita, and she shook my arms. She said, Arlita, I need to know the character and the ways of my God so that I am not shaken. Those scriptures were a turning point in her life that changed her life forever. Those very words. Your granny was captivated by the sea, and you know in her living room the big picture window looking out over the ocean, and above that picture window is a wooden plaque that says in old English lettering, the sea is his, and he made it. Psalm 95, 5. He made it, he owns it, and he rules it. And we often talked about God's strange ways and how inscrutable they are. His way is in the sea and his path in the great waters and his footsteps are not known, the psalmist says in Psalm 77. And one night, very late, she telephoned me. She had a front row seat by her picture window overlooking the ocean and the perfect storm of 1991 
crashing right in front of her. And her description is engraved on my memory. Waves terrifying, like great stallions fiercely pounding up the rocks to the highest cliff, their white manes thrashing wildly in the wind. She was in awe of the raw terror and violence of the waves, but she was exulting in God's beauty at the same time. Those waves trampled down mansions that night. Somehow your granny's cove was spared, and we talked about his ways in the seas, his paths, God's ways, really, really. The oceans, changeable, ungovernable, vast, unfathomable, terrible, overwhelming, and your granny's God has the ruling power. He had that power in your granny's life and in all our lives. And in the very next verse, the psalmist describes himself as a shepherd leading his flock, sheep like still waters, not troubled oceans. What kind of God did she love? A passionate, jealous God with fierce love that can sweep us into his safe arms. She couldn't be moved by the terror of night because she knew a more fierce love, a more passionate lover, God himself, who would move all of heaven and earth to woo and to win her, and you and me. She could rest in his love underneath her, all ar around her is the current of his love. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave passionately. He gave fiercely so that the earth shook. And your granny learned to know his character, and that's why she could trust him with abandonment. That's why she dared to obey him. She hands the baton to you now cheering you on with that deep, warm laughter. Learn to know him, trust him, and obey him. You are loved with an everlasting love, and underneath are the everlasting arms. That was Arlita Winston. Well, it's time to uh, wish you a good day and to thank you for letting us come into your home. Or maybe at the office, maybe out getting some exercise and you decided to join us. Thanks for being a part of our listening family today. Well, on behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out all the resources available at elizabethelliot.org. elizabethelliot.org. Well, we heard earlier from John Hansen and... We have some of his music right now as I speak. And until next time, may God remind you daily that you are loved with an everlasting love. And underneath are the everlasting arms. That's right.